Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. And um, I, I hope those that uh, need a translation will have picked up the uh, translation devices. Uh, if you wish, I can wait a couple of minutes or, or I can get started now. Um, I'm hoping everybody that will get the translation devices will, will be back in. Uh, many times at these conferences, uh, we come looking to understand the opportunity. You know, where's the next big thing? Uh, what is going to happen? Where should we position our companies for the next big opportunity? And the opportunity that I'm going to talk to you about, we think is the biggest opportunity that was ever there. It is the opportunity to bring the next four billion people worldwide on the internet. And this is not a 30-year plan. This is not a 20-year plan. We believe that you will start to have at least the next two or three billion people join the internet in less than three years. In three years, you will see a significant new addition to the internet population of the world. And I want to explain how we define what that four billion is. If you look at the world population in this chart, there are three lines. The top line represents the world's population. The second line repre represents the mobile phone penetration. And the third line is the internet penetration. And near the turn of the century, around 1999 and 2000, the number of mobile phone users and the number of internet users in the world was about the same. There was not a big difference. And the reason was that the prices for mobile phones and computers was in the same range, and most of the users was in the developed world in North America and Europe. After 2000, the penetration of mobile phones extended to the developing world, places like India, China, Latin America, Africa, and the cost of mobile phones started to drop. And as the price difference between mobile phones and internet devices became larger, you started to see a difference in the penetration rate. So today, there are as many, almost as many mobile phone subscriptions in the world as there are people. But there are four billion people in the world that have a mobile phone, have the means of accessing a network on that mobile phone, and have the means of charging that mobile phone, but they're not using the internet. So many times when people look at why is the internet adoption not 100%, if you look at Colombia, there are more mobile phone subscriptions than there are people in the country. But only half the population uses the internet. Why does the other half not use the internet? Do they not have the benefit of the internet? Many times people say, well, it is a lack of education. But that's not the case. In Colombia, 95% literacy rate. It's not a lack of education why they're not using the internet. Today. If a two-year-old child is crying, many times a parent gives them a tablet. It's, it's like the modern day pacifier. So if a two-year-old child can start swiping those screens and get comfortable with a the tablet, then it's not education or lack of education that is limiting internet adoption. Many people will say, but the networks don't exist. And we don't believe that's true. Because if you're using a mobile phone, then you have access to some form of a network. Often people will say, but when you look at places like Africa, they call it the dark continent. If you look at a satellite map of Africa, you see that there's not a lot of light. And they said, that's why there's no internet usage, because people don't have electricity. But that's not true. Today, there are more mobile phone subscriptions in Africa also than there are people. So if you have a mobile phone and you figured out how to charge it, then electricity is not the barrier. We believe that the barrier, the reason that these four billion people are using mobile phones but not using the internet is affordability. It's about cost, 
price, it's about affordability that is limiting that, peop that margin of people off the internet. And we believe that that affordability barrier is about to be broken. And this gold rush of the new internet users, the new billions of people using the internet, is going to happen in the next little while. I will talk mostly in my presentation about the market I'm most familiar with and the market we spend most of our time in, which is India. But I will also mention a little bit about some statistics in Colombia. When you look at poverty levels in the world, extreme poverty, the poorest of the poor, is defined at a dollar and 25 cents a day. I apologize, my figures are all in US dollars. Hopefully it's an easy conversion for you to understand in, in local currency. In India, 300 million people live on less than $1.25 per day, 300 million people. But it's not just that 300 million. I coined a term that I called the forgotten billion. 91.2% of the population lives on less than $4 a day. Over 1 billion people in India live on less than $4 a day, $120 a month. At $120 a month, they will not buy five, $600 computers. They will not buy five, $600 tablets. They will not pay $50 a month for data costs. What we've discovered is that it has to be affordable to their salary levels. And if you think of those people, if you think of this billion people in India, their income levels will only rise as per the economy. The economy in India is growing at about 7%. So for them to double their income will take a very long time. For them to reach the level that they can afford $500, $600 devices will take a very, very long time. So it is the cost of services and devices they have to come down to their level. In fact, when we look at Colombia, there's some interesting figures. Half the population still does not use the internet. The government defines poverty level as $4 per month. Sorry, $4 per day. And 30% of the population, 15 million people, live on less than $4 a day, even in Colombia. And 3 million are in the range of extreme poverty at $1.25. But what's interesting also is that the inequality in income, what's referred to as the Gini index, is very wide in Colombia. And it's wider in Colombia than places like India and Pakistan. That is, that the richest 20% own over 60% of the economy, and the poorest 20% own less than 5% of the economy. This disparity is greater in Colombia than many other parts of the world. So the affordability barrier also exists in Colombia, not just in India, and the ability to bring products and services for that target market is a big opportunity. As I mentioned, it represents half the market. Half the population of this country is using mobile phones, but is not using the internet. And we believe that that affordability barrier needs to be broken. The question is, how much is it? What price point is the right price point for that target market? We did a study in the US to see at what point in the US did we get broad adoption of computers? When did it happen in the US that everybody started buying computers and started using the internet? And we believe that the inflection point in the US happened in 1999, when the cost of a computer dropped below $1,000, because the average salary for the target customer was $4,000, and the $1,000 represented a week of salary. And then we looked at India to say, hey, India has gone from 50 million mobile phone subscribers to now over a billion people using mobile phones. When did that happen? And we discovered the inflection point in India started happening in 2008 when the cost of the lowest price mobile phone 
drop below $35. And $35 in India was one week of salary for the target customer. So in 2010, we started on a journey and we said, can we bring to market a computer that hits one week of salary? If we want to get to that target market, that forgotten billion people in this market, we need to bring the price of the computer to within one week of salary. And of course, everybody said that's impossible. We had the experience of one laptop per child, and they were trying to do $100, and $100 became a very daunting challenge. So $35 seemed ridiculous because people would buy for their iPad the covers for more than $35. So to bring a full computer at this price seemed ridiculous. To do this, we came up with, we, we had to figure out not just the price, we had to figure out what is the demand drivers? Why will people use the internet that have never used the internet? And we decided to focus on two main areas for this. The first one is education. Because what we discovered is, no matter how rich or poor, the wish that every parent has is to educate their child. If you ask the poorest of the poor, and you ask them, what do you wish for your child? more than anything else, they ask for education, even if the child goes hungry, because they know that if they make the sacrifices today, that the result from education in the long term will be positive. Unfortunately, in places like India, the quality of education is linked directly to the income levels, the prosperity of the parents. In fact, while the government tells us that there are about 220 million children in school in India, studies done by NGOs show us that between grades 5 and 8, 43% of the children drop out of school. Grades 9 to 12, 68% of the kids drop out to, from school. And if you extrapolate that, then the number of kids that should be in school instead of 220 million should be 360 million. As many as 140 million kids are not in school under the age of 16 that should be in school. But that's the kids that are not in school. The next question comes, what is the quality of education for the kids that are in school? One of the big reasons that kids are not in school in places like India, of course, is income levels and parents use them for child labor to be able to generate income. But another reason is that 70% of the Indian population is in rural India, it's not in the cities. And in rural India, the number of teachers that don't show up on any given day is about a third. Almost 30% of the teachers on any day are not in school. And that's a big issue. So the result is the quality of education is horrible. There is an organization that did a big study of about 600,000 students uh, earlier this year and found that 25% of class 8 students, grade 8 students, could not read a grade 2 text. These are the p kids that are going to school, not, not remembering the kids that are not in school. Think, think of this is the quality that the people that are going to school, they're receiving. So the study showed that good quality teachers go to the best schools and go to the big cities and the quality of teachers that the poorest of the poor get left with is horrible. The other demand driver, in addition to education, is commerce. If you can show a business how to make money, they will use the internet no matter how small the business is. And in my opinion, a big reason for the success that China has had over the last six or seven years, eight years, is not the genius of the Communist Party. In fact, the reason for that success is, in my opinion, an organization called Alibaba.com. In 1984, the Indian economy was double the size of the Chinese economy, two times. Today, 
the Chinese economy is eight times larger than the Indian economy. So what happens? In 30 years, the Chinese economy grew 16 times as larger in 30 years. What happened? Today, that one website generates over $248 billion worth of online transactions for small, mini, micro manufacturers all over China. So even the small micro manufacturer that has only five employees is able to sell his goods and services everywhere in the world, whereas the total manufacturing exports in a country like India, 1.2 billion people, 1.3 billion people, is only 184 billion, 60, 65 billion less than that one website in China. This is the power of the internet, where millions and millions of small manufacturers, small service providers in the developing world are not on the internet and not able to take advantage of it. So we decided to grab, to create internet adoption, we would focus on two main areas. First was education, and the second one was commerce. But the question is, how do you get the price to $35? And uh, when I used to do this presentation about three years ago, and I would say $35, people's jaws would drop and say, $35, wow, not anymore. Um, because we've driven the whole market down. Today, our entry level devices are at $20. Manufacturing cost of around $20. And they're going down further. And I will explain how that happens. It's not complicated. It's very simple. And why it's simple is that instead of focusing on the latest and greatest, if you focus on the price and work backwards from the price and say, this is the target price for my customer, what is the maximum I can deliver to my customer in this target price? And is the maximum that I can deliver to the customer in this target price good enough or not? We call this the disruption of the good enough. And what you'll discover is that this is the right time in history that the kind of processing power, the kind of memory that can be delivered in $20 and $30 is finally good enough to give the user a strong enough, good enough experience to actually want to use the internet. This was not the case five years ago. This was not the case 10 years ago. This is the case only today. And this is based on an idea by a professor at Harvard by the name of Clayton Christensen. I'm a big fan of Clayton Christensen, uh, so if you've not heard about him, I, I would recommend uh, buy his book. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma. And what he shows is, he shows that the experience that the high-end customer wants even the low-end device exceeds that experience over time. The low-end customer has a certain expectation. The high-end customer has a higher expectation. But over time, even the low-end devices, the low-end technology exceed the expectation of the high-end customer. We don't compete with the iPad. That's not my market. But I will compare and I will show you the difference over the last three years, over the last four years, between our entry level products and the amount of memory and processing power that's in an iPad. So that first purple line represents what the performance of the iPad has been. The bottom line is where we are. And then the two straight lines is what the market expects. When we came out, we were only a 366 megahertz processor with 256 megabytes of RAM. And the iPad was a Cortex-A8 processor, one gigahertz, and 256 of RAM. And then in 2012, we upgraded our devices to be also a Cortex-A8 processor with one gigabyte of RAM. And I would go around saying, is the user experience from the original iPad not good enough 
for that target market who cannot afford anything. But then they had a dual core processor, it went on to a dual core processor with a gigabyte of RAM, and then a 1.3 and a 1.5 gig dual core processor with a gigabyte of RAM. And we supplied to the Indian government for somewhere around 23 or $24 a 1.5 gig dual core processor device tablet with a gigabyte of RAM. And our question is, when the processing power and memory are in the same range, is that experience not good enough for the masses, especially if the price is only 20 or $30? So to create that breakthrough, it's not about a special technological breakthrough. It's the realization that while when Apple launched the original iPad, the Cortex-8 one gig processor used to cost them $35. Today, four years later, that processor, processor cost $1.80. That's it. In fact, if you make a little microwave oven or you make a remote control, the cost of the processor is about the same as what an entry-level device goes. That's how cheap processing power has gotten, and it's getting further. It's getting lower, less expensive. But what we discovered was that it's not as simple as just reducing the cost of the hardware. We have to change the business model. In the markets where the operators are predominant, have a strong distribution network, the operators are used to subsidizing devices with the hope that network services will generate the revenue for them over time. In places like India, the operators do not subsidize the devices. So the devices are very expensive because they're full priced. The market is mostly prepaid and there are no subsidies. But what we discovered was that since our user is so price sensitive, we need to shift the allocation of margins from hardware to other revenue streams. Because when you sell hardware, it generates multiples of revenue streams. And you need to focus on those revenue streams and think of the hardware only as a customer acquisition tool. The hardware is to build a relationship with the customer. That's not where the profit lies. In fact, for us, hardware accounts for less than 25% of our gross margin. Hardware-related services, another 2 or 3%. Network services is a bigger margin than hardware, even in the first year. In fact, content and subscription, as people download e-books and music and, and games and apps and so on, represents a big portion. And then the biggest portion is advertising. Today, Google makes more money than all the Indian wireless operators put together. Two billion people use Google. There's a billion wireless customers in India. Google charges those two billion people nothing and makes more money than all the Indian operators that between them have more than half a million employees. 500,000 employees that set up networks and they pay spectrum fees and, and do heavy advertising, do everything else charge fees to the customer and make less money than the entity that charges them nothing because of advertising. But if you take away the focus from hardware, especially at that entry-level customer, and realize that the margin is much greater. We sell entry-level devices today that start at $20, $25. And on the hardware side, we make about a dollar and a half to two dollars. But in the first year of usage from that same customer, on average, we make around $6. So to me, that $6 is much more valuable than the $2 I make on the sale of the hardware. We decided that as we pursue this business model, that we need to get local content. And as a result, over the last few years, we've done a lot of effort in sponsoring hackathons and working with universities and developing local content. So the markets we operate in, in places like India, most of the content on the devices is very unique and not available commonly on the Play Store or other things. It's very localized. And all we do is do a bunch of pizza parties, give away pop, do hackathons in universities, give away t-shirts and so on, 
and kids create these apps which end up being very powerful in that environment. And that business model can work in every country. It's not expensive. We though decided to change how we would sell services. What we discovered was that a significant portion of the market was using networks that were only 2G. And the experience they would get on the internet wouldn't be acceptable. So we developed a compression algorithm, we developed a compression technology on which we received 18 US patents, a number of international patents, and it reduces by factors of 10 to 30 times the amount of data consumption. It reduces the data consumption so much that the cost of internet for me in India for a full year becomes less than $1. When I buy from the operator on a wholesale basis, it costs me less than $1 for a full year of access. So I take that $1, I add it into the cost of my device, and today in the market you can get a entry level smartphone from us for $25, which includes duties, taxes, the margin for the retailer and the distributor, some margin for me, and 12 months worth of unlimited internet browsing. At that price, you start to get attention. At that price, you start to create a different kind of adoption. So nothing very special, no breakthrough great technology that revolutionizes the world because nobody else could do it. Something very simple, realizing that my customer only has an income of $120 a month, will not spend more than $30 or so for a device, will not spend more than one week of salary, and doesn't know if you'll spend for data, will not spend 10, 20, 30 dollars for data. So I bundled that data with that customer, and we started this first in the tablet market. In India, when we entered the market in 2011, in a whole year, the total number of tablets that were being sold was only 250,000. And 80% of that market was Apple and Samsung. In three years, that market has grown 20 times. And for IT, these have been tough three years because PC market has dipped and the general economies have struggled. But this one segment has grown 20 times in three years. Not just that, a very small player like us who had no presence in the market, became the largest player in that market, and every quarter since 2012 when we launched the market, we're in the top three, number one, two, or three. Every quarter we beat Apple, some quarters we beat Samsung, some quarter they beat us. But in the long term, the market I address is very different than their market. Their market in India is limited to 50 million or 100 million people. My market in India is a billion people that nobody thinks the opportunity exists for. We think that that kind of opportunity exists everywhere in the world. 50% of the people, half the population of Colombia, does not use the internet. The question is why. We believe it's affordability and this is the impact. The result of this for us has been amazing. In fact, it's not just the overall market we have a share in. This is in different price bands what our market share is. So blue is in different price band how many tablets get sold. And in orange is what is our share. In the bottom price band, our market share is 62%. In the overall market, we're 18%. But in that bottom price segment, the bottom segment of that market, it is between 50 to 60% of that market, depending on which quarter you look at. All we did was create affordability into a market that nobody wanted to address. And that gets recognition worldwide. A couple of years ago, Forbes puts out a list called the Impact 15 Social Entrepreneurs that they think will impact the world. We were lucky enough to be included in that. The MIT Technology Review puts out a list of world's 50 smartest companies. 
And all we're doing is making a cheap device. That's all we're doing. Nothing special, no great breakthrough technology, no scientific breakthroughs of sort. That's it. Realizing that 90% of the population in India cannot afford, 50% of the population in Colombia cannot afford, guess what? 20% of the population in the U.S. cannot afford, 20% in the U.S. And creating products for that segment. In fact, United Nations does not do product launches, doesn't happen. There's no iPhone 6 being launched at the UN anytime soon. But the UN launched this product. 150 ambassadors from around the world, and they actually launched the product. And Ban Ki-moon called it the great enabler with the potential to transform people's lives. The biggest opportunity in technology that ever was exists today. Four billion people are going to join the internet in the next three years. I guarantee you that. And the reason it's going to happen is because products and services for them are finally going to become affordable and are deliver a good enough experience for them to want it. And those that recognize it will earn the benefits. And those that don't will watch it from the sidelines. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I hope this was useful. Thank you so much. We, we do have some time. I don't know if there's anybody that has any questions. Happy to take questions for the next few minutes. Uh, address anything that anybody may, may have. Hola, ¿qué tal? Eh, simplemente quería, por un lado, eh, agradecer su venida a Colombia y felicitarlo por este gran proyecto que tiene. Mi pregunta es la siguiente. Después de haber logrado lo que ha logrado en India, Por un lado quisiera saber cuál es su sueño y por otro cómo ve el mundo, los jóvenes del futuro en unos 10 años. So, so thank you for inviting me to Colombia. I'm excited to be here and uh, I think this is a beautiful city. This is where every conference should be. Um, I, I live in Toronto and they still hold conferences in November and January in Toronto and that's not the place to be in November and January. So. Um, uh, so, my, with regards to what my dream is, I truly believe that billions of people are going to join the internet. I, I think it's going to be very different than the last 10 years, uh, and I think it's going to happen very fast. Um, and uh, I'd like to spread this everywhere. Uh, so what we are aggressive in doing is we are creating relationships with wireless operators in different countries. Uh, we've done our first agreement uh, in Colombia, in Latin America, uh, one in Guatemala, one in Nicaragua. And in the next uh, three or four months, you will see us launch in these markets very, very low-cost devices with free internet bundled in there. And I'd really like this revolution to spread everywhere, uh, with or without us. Uh, I, I think that uh, same as electricity and clean water, today the internet is a fundamental human right because it empowers people. It gives them the opportunity to communicate. Uh, with regards to the youth in 10 years, the youth in 10 years will be empowered in ways that we never were, that previous generations cannot imagine, cannot experience. The youth in 10 years will have access to infinite knowledge. Um, I, I, I ask, um, uh, as a tradition in my, in my home, every year I ask my children, I have four children, I ask them, who is your best teacher? And then I go thank them and I give them a gift. Because in my religion, the teacher is a guru, is, is, a, is a, you know, very high respect, is a prophet. And uh, so I, I always go and give them a gift. And last year, when I asked my oldest son, I said, so who was your best teacher this year? He thought about it for a while, and he said, Dad, this year it was you two. Um, and, and I said, well, you know, are, are you being insulting to your teachers? He said, no, 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 I, I had good teachers. But what happens is that when I need to learn how to balance chemical equations, and I don't know how to balance chemical equations, the teacher teaches it one way. I go to YouTube and I type in how to balance chemical equations. I get so many different videos. I look at the best ratings. I watch the first three or four. And while they may all be good, one of them explains it in a way that I understand better than anything else. So the 
idea of a mediocre teacher, of an average teacher, goes away. In 10 years, all our kids will have access to the world's best teachers and the best technologies so that quality of education will not matter if you're rich or poor. It, the quality of education you will receive will be l based on your inspiration about what you want to do. So I, I really think that the world is going to go through an amazing positive growth because the, the masses are not going to be illiterate, because poverty is going to be dealt with. I think the first time in history that in the next few years the extreme poverty will be eliminated. I don't think it'll exist anymore. So I'm very optimistic with where the world's going to be unless we destroy the environment and, 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 and you know something else kills us. Uh, I, I think we, we, we're in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, so maybe you can tell us what do you think or what are your thoughts of, around Mozilla dropping the $25 smartphone? I, I, I think that they didn't put enough behind it with all, you know, no disrespect to them. Here's the thing. You create an operating system in a world where Google is already giving away their OS for free. Right? It's there. They've spent billions of dollars on it. They've got millions of apps around it. And not only is it the revolution with the free operating system, Google is teaching us how to make money from that operating system. Why guys like me exist is I've discovered because of Google that I can make money from a free operating system. I can monetize with apps and advertising and many things. And in fact, not just that, I can get rid of Google from it. Look at what Amazon did. They took that existing operating system, they created their own app store, they got rid of Google from it, and they still were very successful. And that's exactly what we've done in India. We've created our own solution in that regard. And then they created a democracy with the CPU. Three years ago, if you asked me CPU manufacturers, the only two companies I could tell you were Intel or AMD. That's who I think makes CPUs. Today, there are 30 companies making ARM-based processors. And 10 of them are in China who are cutting their throats every day, who are who are driving pricing down, where you know two and a half dollars for a quad core 1.5 gigahertz processor, which two years ago was 18 dollars, right? Which, which are becoming very aggressive in price. So here's the difficulty that Mozilla made. First, they went out with a device that was not only low end, but did not deliver a great internet experience. Did not have an ecosystem of content suppliers, uh, apps, and all those things. And they went up against Google, who had devices already in the market by players like us, at the same price, giving away free internet. So in India, they came up. They started with a 2,000 rupee device. We went up directly against them with a 2,000 rupee device. And we said, hey, it's not Mozilla and 3,000 apps. It is Android and 2 million apps and free internet. And my technology for compression that makes it faster and so on. So, I think there's still an opportunity for Mozilla. They have to be a lot stronger. They have to spend two, three, four hundred million dollars to create that ecosystem. Uh, without that, I don't think they can be successful. I don't think they were ready for market. I've got this big red light flashing here, okay? You know, before the explosion happens. So maybe, maybe we can take one, one more question. Is that okay or more? Okay, I, I'm told a small question I can take. Uh, w which is a problem because your question can be small, but my answer never is small. So, uh, so if there's any additional questions, I'd be happy to take, and then then we we can uh, we can end. Cool. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for for listening to me. I appreciate it.